So with that said, let's start with a little review. Um, I think we did this one the other day, um, but just to review where we were, we had uh, our excess sodium hydroxide be our first step here. Um, so when we have a sequence of reactions, like, like I mentioned before, it's usually helpful to draw out the result of each reaction um, just to make sure that you didn't, um, that you don't miss something. Um, and while you guys are giving that a go, I will also mention, um, I grabbed some of the problems for this week's assignment, it came from a different textbook. So they might write things a little bit differently, but it doesn't, I don't think that there's anything on their reactions that we haven't covered yet. But for, for instance, instead of writing DMS for dimethyl sulfamide, or dimethyl sulfide, um, they write CH32. So it looks like S, which is dimethyl sulfide. They just don't write it as DMS. There's a couple of things like that where you want to pay attention. Um, and if you see if you see an unfamiliar um, reagent that you're not sure what it is or what it does. Um, double check, you can double check it by typing it into Google and seeing if there's another name for it or what the structure actually looks like to see if that's something that we're more familiar with. Um, this was the one that jumped out at me. There's probably one or two things, other things that I didn't mention um, that, that are slipping my mind right now. Um, but if you're, if you're unsure about any of those things, Google it, send me an email, um, that kind of thing, and I'll, and I'll clarify. All right, so our first, our first intermediate here, we just get the terminal alkyne, at which is deprotonated. So then we have a nucleophile that can act and replace the chlorine on an ethyl group. So we're gonna be adding an ethyl group to this molecule we already have. And then we're going to use the poison catalyst, Lindler's catalyst, to partially hydrogenate this. And remember that if we're using a catalyst um, that is, if we're using a solid catalyst, and most of these, these metal catalysts are, um, then we're going to get the cis product. We only see the syn addition for our hydrogenation. So our final product, I'm going to draw the bond going that way, would look something like that. No, sorry, that's trans. I did it myself. There we go, sis. All right, so that covers most of the reactions we talked about the other day. Um, if you- so, um, Sean, can you just clarify why that is trans? Again, sorry, it's a bit early. So this, this one that I've corrected it to is the cis form because the two, the two higher priority things coming off of the alkene mm -hmm. are pointed in the same direction. So we added the hydrogen to the same side of the, of the pi bond. So the hydrogen we added is, are both pointing roughly the same way. And that means that the other things that were attached are pointing the same way as yeah. well. Okay, that, yeah, I get it now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. No problem. More descriptively, it's a sin addition. If you want to think about the addition happened to the same side of the pi bond. So they all have to be pointed. So the things you added have to be pointed the same way.
All right, so then our other, so our two pi bond reactions that can just happen twice with very little changing. Um, the only thing we added on these top three reactions was that we can pick pick our catalyst to say whether we want to fully hydrogenate or partially hydrogenate in the sin addition or partially hydrogenate in the trans addition with hydrogenation. Hydrohalogenation works the same way it always would. And you can think of it as happening in two steps. If you add HBr, you're going to add the hydrogen to one side, the bromine to the other, and it's going to follow Markovnikov. Um, and it's going to follow Markovnikov for both of them. So usually what happens if you do hydrohalogenation is you're going to wind up of, if you do that twice to an alkyne, you're going to wind up adding a bromine, two bromines to the same carbon or two chlorines to the same carbon. Um, if they're both equally substituted, then you'll wind up with some mixture of the two of them, where half the time you have both of them on the same carbon and half of the time the two bromines are going to be adjacent to each other. Um, so, I, it, but it follows Markovnikov's rule, just like it would with an alkene. And halogenation works the same way. Halogenation is now a way we can add a total of four bromines or chlorines to one of these um, alkynes because we add two bromines for the first pi bond and then two bromines for the second pi, pi bond. Um, ozonolysis was the last thing we covered and it's, it works the same way. We're always going to be chopping up a molecule with ozonolysis, but if we have three bonds we're replacing with oxygen bonds, instead of turning it into a carbonyl, we make the carboxylic acid. Right, so, but the general principle is the same. If you've got an alkyne and you put it through ozonolysis, you find your triple bond, draw a line through it, and put a put a carboxylic acid group on each of those carbons instead. So let's practice that. Let's say we have cyclooctyne and we put it through ozonolysis. And I'll do that one on the whiteboard here. Might as well draw it big. I'm only drawing one molecule here. All right, so we have cyclooctyne. Zoom in on it too. If we put it through ozonolysis, which means first we make the ozonide and then we expose it to dimethyl sulfide. So we're going to be breaking up our molecule right here. And on both of those carbons, we're adding a carboxylic acid group. The trick with that to watch out for is because carboxylic acid is, as a functional group is usually written with the carbon included, make sure we still end up with the right number of carbons. We're not removing any carbons from this molecule. So we should wanna make sure we still wind up with eight carbons. Just wind up, we're gonna get eight carbons in a row that, and on each end, we get a carboxylic acid. So our product would look like, so we're breaking that. So to use our same technique as ozonolysis before, leave all the carbons in the same place at first. And then if we wanted to clean that up, we would just have eight carbons in a row, make a chain of, of eight carbons. And so if everybody's good with this part, I'll erase this and redraw and cleaned up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight.
So if we take cyclooctane and put it through ozonolysis, this will be our final product. And I'll remind everyone of something that Casey reminded me of that the book also mentions too. Um, if you chop off a single carbon, if you have a terminal alkyne, when you do this, it actually does not stop at the formic acid. Um, because we're putting this in a pretty harsh oxidizing environment, if you're going to be chopping off a, let's say we had propine, and we put it through ozonolysis, when we take, when we cut off just a single carbon using this process, that carbon doesn't stop being oxidized at the at formic acid at a carboxylic acid. If it's a single carbon being chopped off, it takes it all the way to CO2. So same basic principle, cutting right there. That's going to leave us with a two carbon acid group on one side. So we wind up with. acetic acid, or also known as ethanoic acid. Um, from one of our sides, the other side, um, I actually, I, when I wrote it on the board on Tuesday, I did it wrong. It we would think it would start by just going to a one, one carbon carboxylic acid, um, but then it continues to be oxidized because of this um, fairly strong oxidizing environment and because of how unstable formic acid is. And so you would just wind up with CO2 as your other carbon in this instance. All right, so ozonolysis, not all that different. Um, and the nice thing about this chapter is we haven't even really added any new mechanisms yet, right? The only mech, the only new wrinkles in this that we've had, we've put in there are basically saying it reacts the same way, but with a slightly different twist to it. Um, and that's going to continue. The only new mechanism we're going to add for this chapter is that re are those rearrangement reactions, the tautomerization reactions. And so let's go into those. And then we will be done with chapter eight, is it? Nine? Chapter nine. Um, but the, the <clears throat> big takeaway from, from the difference in hydration reactions is that you get carbonyls instead of alcohols. If we hydrate these pi bond, these alkynes once, we, we wind up with that enol shape. And so the mechanism looks a lot like this. Um, and so we use mercury to catalyze our acid catalyzed hydration. Um, and it does make this mer mercurinium ion. Um, so that it looks a lot like oxymercuration and it behaves a lot like it as well, but this is technically the acid catalyzed version. Um, and then once you get your mercurinium ion, it, that's a ring opening reaction, just like most of these three-sided rings we've seen. If you have oxygen around as H2O, the lone pair on H2O, can come in here and attack the more substituted carbon. So you keep it as a um, as, as a Markovnikov reaction, because we're going to put our OH on the more substituted carbon here. Um, and then we'll wind up making this intermediate right here, where you've got mercury still attached to the 
less substituted carbon, and then you have um, an OH attached to the more substituted carbon. And then what winds up happening is you, you wind up adding this, the proton second, you add the hydrogen for the hydration, winds up happening second. Um, and it's basically going to displace the mercury. You wind up, as you can see that you wind up um, protonating the alkene that's still there, um, which makes a rather unstable um, intermediate where you have the mercury still attached, but you also have a carbocation. And then if you have that carbocation, um, basically you've got an incomplete valence on that carbon, right? So it's going to preferentially fill that. Um, and in doing so, it's stable enough to exist like that because you do have this resonance structure where the oxygen can donate some electron density to it. Um, but as soon, pretty quickly after that, you're just going to wind up with the mercury leaving and leaving behind the electrons. And the electrons just move over to remake that pi bond and you wind up making the enol at the end. And enol, um, think of the, pre the suffixes, en for alkene, OL for alcohol. So we're making an alcohol attached to an alkene. Um, and so the net result of this is just like high, um, oxymercuration or, or acid catalyzed hydration. We wind up breaking a pi bond, adding an OH to the more substituted carbon and an H to the less substituted carbon. What happens next is one of the two new, completely new mechanisms we're going to look at in this chapter. Um, and that's that's that acid catalyzed tautomerization. Um, and it's, it turns out that that these enols are unstable enough that if there's either acid or base around, um, you wind up with with them rearranging to make a carbonyl. Um, and whether exactly what the carbonyl looks like depends on which carbon it's attached to. Is it a primary carbon or is it a secondary carbon? Um, but either way, we wind up going through the same process, which is that the if it's the acid catalyzed tautomerization, you wind up with the pi bond being protonated, just like our other acid catalyzed addition reactions and making this intermediate here that looks a lot like the intermediate we were just looking at, except we don't have mercury attached here, but we wind up with a um, carbocation that on the carbon that's attached to an oxygen and that oxygen has a lone pair. So that oxygen having a lone pair means that it has a resonance structure where it's sharing those electrons with the um, carbocation so that at least at the very least everything has a full valence the second resonance structure is more stable than the first resonance structure because at least we still have a positive charge on an oxygen so the oxygen is sharing more than it wants to but at least everything has a full valence um, and then so if you have an oxygen with three bonds and one of those bonds is to a hydrogen one of our favorite maybe not favorite, and that might not be the right word, but one of our standard steps that we can do in, me in a mechanism is um, anything that's got an extra bond and one of those bonds to a hydrogen can just lose that proton. You just need anything around that can act as a base, um, can accept that extra proton and the oxygen keeps the electrons. All right, and so, all it, it's really just two proton transfers with a resonance structure in the middle is all it takes to rearrange these things. And you, the carbonyl we wind up making at the end is far more stable than, than the enol. And so this can happen with any enol. Um, and it does happen all the time, even if, even if it's not the result of a hydration reaction 
um, if you make, if you have any carbonyl, every carbonyl will also have an enol form that it's constantly in equilibrium with. Um, so if you if you have a bottle of acetone, half you know more than half the time, probably ninety nine percent of the time, at least ninety five percent of the time, your acetone is going to be in the in the ketone form, like it's drawn here. But the other one to five percent of the time, it's actually present in that enol form, just because it will always constantly be reacting back and forth. So if we can, if this happens with acid and base, and we just went through the acid catalyzed tautomerization, um, as just a, a clarification, we almost never can isolate the enol because there's almost always a, either a little bit of acid or a little bit of base. It's really hard to get a perfectly neutral solution that has neither acid nor base. Um, so we, it has been observed experimentally. We can see an enol form sometimes, um, but you have to do go about it very, very, very carefully um, in order to actually see this um, in lab. And of course, not physically see it, but we can. You can tell the difference in an NMR between these two forms because we moved a proton, right? So moving a proton from one form to the other means that we're going to have a different number of in. Um, a different integration of the peaks and we're going to have an alcohol peak versus not having an alcohol peak and so we can actually observe this pretty easily in a proton nmr um, because we moved a proton so we really do have two different compounds um a quick clarification the hydroboration looks the exact same as it does for an alkene. And that means, and it still follows our same rule. So we're still anti Markovnikov here. And the anti Markovnikov reaction, when it rearranges itself, is going to not give you a ketone, it'll give you an aldehyde. Remember that the difference between those was that a ketone is a carbonyl that's in the middle of a carbon chain, and an aldehyde is, is a carbonyl that's at the end of a carbon chain. So an aldehyde specifically is going to have that hydrogen also attached to the carbonyl carbon. But other than that, our two, our two hydration reactions look pretty similar. We just have to use, we kind of combined the oxymercuration and the acid catalyzed hydration into one mechanism because we need the mercury to catalyze um, the alkynes. The hydroboration really doesn't change at all. Hydroboration looks the exact same. It just adds on this tautomerization at the end. So I showed you the acid catalyzed tautomerization. If you don't have an acid around, you instead have base around. Why don't you guys give this one a try? See if you guys can come up with a mechanism. I'll give you guys about five minutes to work on it on your own, then we'll work through it. Remember, if when you have an acid catalyzed reaction, the first step is usually protonating something. If you have a something that's base catalyzed, your first step might be deprotonating something.
All right, how'd that go? Everybody get at least a try and attempt on paper. So remember, I wasn't just trying to give you a hint for this reaction, but for pretty much anything that's either acid catalyzed or base catalyzed, your first step is either going to be protonating or deprotonating accordingly. So in this case, the most acidic proton is the one that's attached to the alcohol. And so I'm most acidic, meaning that it's easiest to deprotonate there. So if you have a base around, the first thing it's going to do is pull that proton off. And you're going to be left with an intermediate that has a negative charge. Well, while this is not necessarily as big a deal as having something without a complete valence, but it's still something where we can draw resonance structures and sharing that charge around, it's going to make it more stable. Um, so once you make that enolate ion, and anytime you, you hear the suffix eight, A-T-E, means it's the deprotonated form of something. So our carboxylic acid that's deprotonated becomes carboxylate. An enol that's deprotonated becomes an enolate. Nitric acid that's deprotonated becomes nitrate. Right, so it goes back to that same gen chem inorganic acid nomenclature. The deprotonated name is always an eight. Um, so our enolate ion has these two resonance structures, one of which has an extra pair of of, pro, of uh, electrons on a carbon. So we would expect that the resonance structure on the left is going to be the more stable one. So if we, have, if we have to have a negative charge, more stable to put the negative charge on, a, on an oxygen because it's more electronegative. But we do have this other resonance structure that happens that can be protonated. So once again, it's just two quick proton transfers with a resonance structure in between and you wind up making either the aldehyde or if this was the um, a ketone that we started with instead of a primary enol, then we would wind up with, sorry, if it was a secondary enol instead of a primary enol, we would get a, ke a ketone at the end, right? The process does not change whatsoever for the whether it's a, going to make a ketone or an aldehyde. Process is the exact same. So let's see. Let me double check that I didn't put these in. Um, in the assignment for today, as it doesn't really matter, we can still go through them anyway, since we have some time. Um, but just so everybody is on the same page there, as soon as Canvas loads. I need to change that link. That's not going to link to the right assignment now. Um, so don't go about it that way. Get through, get to it or through the assignments for starters. And here's our quiz homework for week four. Yeah. So the first, the first problem on there is the sequence of reactions. Practice. Um, one thing that does change slightly about the hydroboration is when we were talking about an alkene, we usually just use plain borane, just BH3 as our, as our reactant. Um, because we want to be sure to only add a single oxygen, we don't want this to happen a whole bunch of times. Um, it gets easier to keep track of the stoichiometry for this hydroboration if you use a a um, reactant that has only one hydrogen on a boron. 
So this this is going to act just like BH3, except that it, because it only has one hydrogen to give, um, it'll only react once. So we were not going to have, remember with hydroboration, we had that you add the, your R group to boron, and then you do it two more times to get three things attached to your boron, three R groups attached to your boron. This is a way of making it so that it only happens once if you start with a boron compound that already has two R groups attached. <clears throat> so don't be thrown by that. It's going to work the same way. The mechanism superficially will look a little bit different, but for the most part, it's going to be the exact same process. So what we have here is first thing we have is we're going to make an acetylide ion by pulling that proton off of, of um, one of the carbons. Then we're going to we're going to do a substitution reaction with a methyl iodide. So our first intermediate I guess it'd be our second intermediate. Our first intermediate is just going to be is just going to be the acetylide ion, the deprotonated acetylene, right? And then the second intermediate is going to be using that as a nucleophile. So we're going to be adding a methyl group. You don't have to have that hydrogen written, but since I'm showing all the other um, atoms attached to the to the alkyne, seemed weird to me to not. Oh, excuse me. Um. So then the second step is we're going to go through hydroboration. So we're going to hydrate it. We're going to put an OH group on the less substituted carbon. So it's going to start by turning into an enol. And I believe that this is going to preferentially put the oxygen on um, trans relative to this so hydroboration was an anti-addition, if I'm remembering correctly. We just want to double check that if it's an anti-addition, we're going to get the trans product here. Does anybody remember that off the top of their head or have their notes handy? Okay. Right, that's just the methyl. My computer just gets weird when I try to write too close to the edge of my tablet screen. And then the other hydrogen is still here. There's the other part of the hydration was the hydrogen added. The more substituted carbon. And at the end, it's not really going to even matter whether it was trans or cis in this intermediate because it's going to immediately rearrange itself into the aldehyde, and the aldehyde is not does not have a cis or a trans. So it doesn't wind up making much of a difference in these cases because it only will show up as the enol um, is going to have the cis versus the trans form. But then once as soon as it rearranges itself, we will get. an ethyl group attached to an aldehyde. All right, so the net that's the net result of this proton moving over and the be basically being attacked by those electrons and then the the oxygen's extra pair of electrons comes down to make the carbonyl.
All right, so our final product. Looks like that. All right, so you can see how starting from acetylene is a really important precursor for a lot of stuff in organic chemistry because starting from acetylene and um, some some alkyl halides, and we'll go over how to make those um, next chapter. Starting from some alkyl halides and acetylene, you can make just about whatever you want as far as carbon structures go. So what would be the net result for the second one here? So remember after steps one and two, when we added an ethyl group to one side of our alkyne, so it would look like that'd be our skeletal structure after step two. And then the mercury acid catalyzed hydration follows Markovnikov's rule. So we get the oxygen goes on to the more substituted carbon. So our enol form would look like that. Still all four carbons. And then once it rearranges, we're going to get two butanone. Aldehydes and ketones are named with suffixes just like, just like alcohols. Um, and we'll go over this more formalized one in not chapter nine, but chapter 10, we start getting into oxygen um, based, more oxygen based reactions. Um, anything that ends in own, O-N-E, is a ketone. Anything that ends in al or aldehyde is an aldehyde. So the first one we made, propanal, was our final product. Three carbons in a row on the one end of which is an aldehyde. And this one we made two, or we made butanone. And not going to test you on that nomenclature or anything yet, but just so when you hear me use it, and so you can start seeing it, you'll start seeing it in the, crop up in the textbook and um, probably all over the place. A lot of um, a lot of steroid treatments are are ketones. Cortisone, for instance, cortisone is a is a ketone. It's the slightly more oxidized form of cortisol which is a stress hormone. Cortisone is a ketone form, but it's the same molecule that's just been oxidized one step further to turn cortisol into cortisone. All right, questions on these two? Um, your Assignment is posted. Um, and again, it starts with, with three that we've already gone through together. So I gave you the head start there. It's two pages. Um, number 36 here is, is the same, um, same type of thing that we did for last week, where it's like, okay, the same molecule reacts with all of these different things. So it's just, it's the similar type of reaction to 41. It's just not drawing it out for you. So practice writing it the right way. Practice, draw your molecule, draw your reaction arrow and your reactants. You don't have to show the mechanism, um, but at the very, but it uh, would be a good idea to practice how we would write this so that you get used to showing it the right way. Um, and anytime you see followed by, Remember, that's a key that you need to do it in two steps. Step one is R2BH, 
and then step two would be the hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. <clears throat> um, and then a couple synthesis ones. Um, none of them are too tricky, but are they're going to require you to to think things through a little bit. And then the second page is just more practice. Um, another what reagents are needed part. These are all one step synthesis. I think they're all one step anyway. Um, and let's see if there was anything else. Oh, that's the, the other thing that shows up here is that we didn't bother saying in, um, when it came to ozonolysis, we didn't bother saying um, that it has to be done at dry ice temperatures, but it, it does, or else you wind up with that. If you want it to be done in a um, predictable way, you have to have ozonolysis, ozonolysis happening at minus 78 Celsius. Um, otherwise, you get a whole mess of products because everything starts reacting with everything. It'll still denature proteins and, and sanitize your water. Um, but it, in OCHEM, we actually care what our products look like, not just that they're dead. Um, that's more the biologist side where they care about where they uh, treat it like that. Um, so if, when you see at 78 Celsius, that's just telling you um, to do it carefully. The other caveat I would put on here, the, the other reaction that we did not, I guess we did, we did for the alkenes. If you have acid catalyzed hydration, you can also have acid catalyzed alcohol addition, right? We talked about those. So just pay attention to what's your sec, what's your nucleophile and some of these addition reactions. Was there anything weird about, oh, the CH2Cl2 is just, that's just your solvent. Dichloromethane is really common solvent in, in OCHEM. So it's just telling you that your solvent is, is dichloromethane. All right, any, any questions before I turn you guys loose on the assignment? All right. Um, I'll change that link so that from the week week four overview, um, you can get to this. Um, yes, I will post this as soon as I can. Um, it might not be for a little bit because I have to make sure I'm not doing it while one of the interview candidates is talking. Um, and I will also, Emily, since you were a couple minutes late, um, you missed the part where I said, if you include your random OCHEM question in, about the material or anything else, um, it does not ask for it here. But if you do include that, when you submit this, you get um, one and a half that extra credit points in the quiz category um, for that one. So don't forget to do that. And I will 